Good Sunday morning and welcome to our online service here at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church. We especially want to welcome you if you're finding us for the very first time or if you're no longer able to venture out. Let's open this morning in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day in which your creation reminds us that every blessing we enjoy comes by your amazing grace. Please bless this time together as we worship you in spirit and in truth, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we do each Sunday, let's begin with a song. Welcome to worship, everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. 
If you're new or visiting us today and would like to find out more about all we have going on, please fill out one of the white Get In Touch cards that can be found in the pew racks or the chapel and drop it off at our Connection Center right outside of the sanctuary. You can also sign up to receive our weekly email by clicking the link on the bottom of our homepage at lcpc.net. The LCPC family is invited to break bread and make friends at an informal potluck in Koopman's Hall today, right after worship. No sign up is needed, just bring a dish to share. You could still run out and get something real quick and enjoy a time of nourishment and fellowship. All are welcome, even if you don't have a food item. And those who join us will also hear more about efforts underway to deepen connections among the women of LCPC. We plan to make this a monthly fellowship opportunity, so mark your calendars for the next Potluck Sunday, February 18th, and a Palm Sunday Potluck, March 24th. We can't wait to see you there. Mission Arizona is back. We are so excited to be giving our students at Abide the opportunity to serve on this fun spring break mission trip. One of the ways to support this ministry is to come shop at their rummage sale Saturday, February 24th in Koopman's Hall from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. There will be some great deals there, and they would also love your donations of gently used clothes, housewares, books, toys, etc. But no large appliances or furniture, please. You can drop donations off in Koopman's Thursday, February 22nd from 12 noon to 7 p.m. and Friday, February 23rd from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. To help with the rummage sale or for donation questions, please contact Jerry White at the address shown. Children's Ministry is hosting a Parents' Night Out on Friday, February 16th from 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. We invite families from LCPC, CFC, and our community to drop off children ages three to 12 in Koopmans for dinner games, and a movie so you can enjoy a night to yourselves. This event has a suggested donation of $20 per child, which will go towards an upcoming Student Ministries, that's 7th through 12th grade, mission trip to Arizona. Please pre-register using the QR code or at our events page at lcpc.net if you plan to join us. Hope to see your kids there. And that's it for this week. i
is my confidence is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness and I Please join me now for corporate prayer of confession. Father God, we come before you today to worship your name, to sing of the holy, amazing works that you have done. Lord, so often we have been preoccupied by our own works. We have focused on what we feel that we can do to earn your love. But Lord, we acknowledge today that actually while we were still sinners, you showed your love for us in that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. So it is by grace that we stand, God. And we thank you, Father God, for that grace, that once for all sacrifice, which paid the debts that would separate us and brought us into your family, God. So God, would you help us, help us to live out this calling of being your children. Help us fulfill those greatest commandments to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. God, would your Holy Spirit fill our lives this week. It is in your good name that I do pray, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, let us continue worship this morning as we turn to the Word of God. And I will be reading a couple of scripture lessons for us today. Our first scripture lesson comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. And I will be reading Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 to 11. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water grooves of flourishing trees. 
I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was a reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. And from the New Testament, I would like to read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. This is the very last portion of the Sermon on the Mount. So these are the words of our Lord, the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. O oh Lord, would you speak to your people in your house this morning? O oh Lord, may the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. As we continue our journey in the book of Ecclesiastes, I put a title to my meditation today, Are We Building Castles in the Sand? Are We Building Castles in the Sand? I read a story about a rich American businessman who was vacationing in Mexico. A while in Mexico, the wealthy American businessman was so disturbed to find a fisherman just sitting lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you out there fishing? The wealthy man asked. Because I have caught enough fish For today, the fisherman replied, why don't you catch more fish than you need? The rich man asked again, and what what would I do with them? You could earn more money, came the impatient reply, and buy a better boat so you could go deeper and even catch more fish. You could purchase better nets, Catch even more fish and make more money. Soon you will have a fleet of boats and be rich like myself. The fisherman asked it again, then what would I do with all this money? American businessman replied back and he said, you could just sit back, relax, and enjoy life as I do now. With a big smile on his face, the simple fisherman replied, and what do you think I am doing right now? (laughs) And what do you think I am doing right now? If your purpose, if your ultimate goal is to sit back, relax, and enjoy life, that is what exactly I am doing right now. I truly believe that life is simple. It is way simpler than you and I uh, may ever think about it. If you are to examine your life today, if you are to honestly examine your life today, how would you describe your life? Do you think you live a happy life? Are you satisfied? What is one thing that you will finally make or that it will finally make you satisfied. 
because we tend to think that our happiness is found just over the next hill. You and I just keep working harder and harder, making money. We pursue new relationships. We keep ourselves busy. Do you live a happy life? Do you live a fulfilled life? Do you live a satisfied life? I'm grateful that we have the book of Ecclesiastes because this is an experience of someone who wrestled with that same question for so many years of his life. King Solomon wrestled with that question. What is this life is all about? And as I said last week, we really do not have to reinvent the wheel. There is someone who did it all, who tried it all, and he gives us his experience as a human being, as someone who pursued life to the full. In chapter 1, if we want to put a conclusion, a summary of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we see a man who pursued wisdom and knowledge, deep wisdom and more knowledge. The first pursuit that we see with the intention, with the hope that someday that wisdom, that knowledge will satisfy the desire of his heart. The first thing that we see in Ecclesiastes 1 is that intellectual pursuit. Well, being on the top of his class and attaining wisdom and knowledge brings Solomon fulfillment and joy. Solomon came to realize that knowledge did not satisfy his hunger. In Ecclesiastes 1.8, at 118, this is what we see. Ecclesiastes 118, Solomon said, For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, he says, the more grief. Wow. Why he would say that? Why Solomon would say, With much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Why Solomon would say something like that? Because basically, wisdom, knowledge, only gives us the real understanding of the world, but it doesn't solve the problems of the world. (laughs) It does not. Turning on the light does not change the room itself. It will just show how messy the room might be. You turn on the light, you see you are knowledgeable now of what is going on, of your surroundings. But does this solve your problem? No. The more knowledge, the more grief. With too much wisdom comes too much sorrow. As I say, turn on the lights, and you see all what needs to be done around the room. Solomon is just frustrated with the limitation of knowledge in chapter 1. King Solomon had tried it all, and he he gave us some helpful insights in in this book. So in chapter 2, he continued to pursue other stuff. He continued to pursue other things. Ecclesiastes 2, I put in my notes here for today, is more relevant than tonight's news. It is more scarier than any Halloween horror movie. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 paints a dark picture of a man on a quest, a man searching and seeking, a man always looking but never finding. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, we see Solomon seeking other ways to fulfill the desire of his heart. He is seeking other avenues to fulfill the desires of his heart. He lays out three primary paths people travel down to find meaning and purpose, happiness and fulfillment. And he gives us the warning at least a couple times in chapter 2. He gives us a warning, hey, people, hey, people, listen. You won't find what you are looking for down the road. My warning, do whatever you want in life, but you will not find what you are looking for down the road. So what are the three major things that Solomon gives us in here that he tried, never worked it out either? As I said in chapter one, wisdom was his pursuit. In chapter two, especially verses one to three, he gives us the pursuit or highlights the pursuit of pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure. This is what he says in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He said, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless, he says. 
Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? So at the end of the day, he comes and he says, I've tried it all. All the pleasures of life, they didn't really accomplish anything. What does pleasure accomplish? The Hebrew word uh, translated pleasure in here means that which is pleasant to the sight. Whatever his eyes desired, he said, let me get it. It may bring me some joy. It may bring me some fulfillment and satisfaction. The word pleasure in here, that which is pleasant to the sight, that which is pleasant to the taste, whatever is a meal may, he, he probably said, man, this meal is so good. Let me try it. It may bring me some joy. That which is pleasant to the smell. It's a word in Hebrew that is actually uh, captures the, the heart of all the pleasures of life. But Solomon comes to us again with his conclusion with the pleasure. He said, I am so sorry to say it did not work out. And then in verses 4 to 7, chapter 2, verses 4 to 7, he tried something else. He said, well, it seems that wisdom never worked. It seems that pleasure did not work. Let me try projects, especially you men. You love projects. <laughs> Men love projects. Let me try some projects, big projects. Let me tackle some of those big projects. He said in Ecclesiastes 2, 4 to 7, he said, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water grooves of, flour of flourishing trees. I bought males and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Well, I'm sure that there is some fulfillment in a project. You know, in, in designing and building, there are some fulfillment. But we are left unsatisfied at the end of the day or with little satisfaction. No matter how magnificent our projects might look, they do not fill the emptiness of our hearts. You may notice that actually in that passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon uses a plural all the time. He didn't even, you know, like build a house. No, he built houses. Not only a garden, no, gardens. Vineyards, parks, everything is in the plural in there. His building and landscape projects were great projects. In fact, in 1 Kings 7, tells us that it took him 13 years to build his own palace. 13 full years to build his own palace. But there is this, this neither fulfilled the desire of his heart. All the great projects that he tackled. But there is something really unique in this passage, and I want to bring it to your attention. You're going to love this. Uh, it was like, for me, it was like an aha moment. If you, if you look in that list of the projects and gardens and vineyards and all the great things that he, uh, that he lists in there, it actually seems odd that in this list of all the buildings and projects, it does not mention the biggest the most historically significant thing that he built. You know what is that? The temple. It is not in there. Did you notice that? The temple in Jerusalem is not in there. Why? Well, we know that in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, the king's was, was a magnificent building. It took, it took him full seven years to accomplish in my opinion, because whatever investment we make in the kingdom of God is not vanity. That is the point here. Whatever investment, he never listed the temple, and he said that also was a vanity. No, whatever we invest in the work of the kingdom is not vanity. It is not in vain. It has some eternal, eternal value to it. That is why the temple is not listed in there. The temple was built for the glory of God, but the palace was built for the glory of Solomon. And what was built for the glory of Solomon was at the end of the day, vanity, meaningless. But what was built for the glory of God 
had eternal value to it. And then I love how the scripture puts it in here. I love how the scripture puts it in here. Whatever time you spend around here, this is probably the most important time of your life, the time that you spent around here doing the work of the kingdom. The most joyful contribution you make, the most joyful check that you write, it should be the check that you write to the work of the kingdom because this what bears eternal value. This what bears fulfillment and satisfaction as we engage in the work of the kingdom. But finally, we find another pursuit just real quick. In this chapter, we, we find the pursuit of pleasure. We find the pursuit of projects. And we find the pursuit of positions, prominence, from, from the pursuit of wisdom, pleasure, and projects, Solomon moved on to the pursuit of positions and prominence. And this is Solomon's own account in verses 8 to 11, chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. He said, I acquired silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And indeed he was. He was so wealthy. I mean, no one ever in the history will compare to Solomon's wealth. I denied myself nothing, he says, my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Yet, in verse 11, he continued to say, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the heaven, he said. In other words, Solomon built his castles in the sand. And he came to that conclusion, it's not going to really bring you to that point of fulfillment. From the pursuit of knowledge to the pursuit of pleasure, and from the pursuit of projects to the pursuit of wealth, Solomon came back empty-handed. He came back from a long journey of a chasing after the wind. As you reflect on your life, as you reflect on your life today, I want to ask you, I really want to encourage you to, to ponder this question this week. Is your life meaningful? Is your life meaningful? Do you live a fulfilled, satisfied life? From chapter one, we, I said that life is meaningless when it is missing that spiritual dimension to it. Life is meaningless when it is missing, when eternity not in mind, life is vanity, life is meaningful. And again, we don't, really wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Here is a man who tried it all, and he gives us the conclusion of his life, some valuable insights, some great lessons in life. Take it from the scripture this morning. Take it from the mouth of Solomon today. Let me challenge you again this week as I conclude. What is one thing, that is one, one step you can take this week to put Jesus at the center of your world? If you are to identify one thing, small, it could be a small thing, what is one thing, what is one step you can take this week to put Jesus at the center of your world? Because when Jesus at the center of your life, when Jesus at the center of your world, there is joy, there is fulfillment, there is satisfaction, and to God alone be the glory now and forevermore. Amen. Would you take a moment to reflect on this message this morning? What, what, what is one thing that you can take home today? What is just one thing that you can take home from the message today? Would you pray for your life? Would you pray for more room of Jesus in your, li in your life and in your heart? Oh God, we come before you and we are just grateful, Lord, to be able to reflect on this this morning. Father God, would you help us to live a Christ-centered life. 
Would you help us, Lord, to live with eternity in mind? So whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we engage in, whatever we commit to, may Christ be at the center of all of this. We thank you for the valuable lessons that we see in the book of Ecclesiastes here. We know that neither wisdom nor pleasure. We know that, Lord, neither projects nor positions will satisfy the desire of our heart. Would you fill us with Jesus today? Amen. Friends, as we wrap up our worship service this morning, receive God's blessing and benediction. Friends, take it from God's word this morning. Take it from Solomon's mouth. He had it all, yet he says it is all empty in the end. Our souls were made for satisfaction in one place, and that is in relationship with our Creator, with our Savior, with God. Speaking to the nation of Israel, Isaiah the prophet says, Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? He continues to say, Listen to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. Our delight, our true delight is found in the Lord. Our true delight is found in the life of obedience. Our true delight is found in the life of discipleship. And now, church, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and the friendship, the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us this morning. We hope this has been a blessing to you and that you found yourself drawing closer to God. We also hope you'll make plans to join us soon in person. We meet together at 10 o'clock Sunday mornings in the sanctuary with singing led by our praise band and in the chapel with hymns and classical music led by our choir. Be sure to reach out to us at the church if you are feeling alone or disconnected. We have kind, caring people who will come along beside you. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. <laughs>